Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining today's Midwest and Missouri River Basin Drought Early Warning System webinar, which will feature the newly released Iowa Drought Plan. My name is Molly Wollison, and I am a Regional Drought Information Coordinator with NOAA's National Integrated Drought Information System, or NIDIS. Next slide. First, allow me to cover some brief housekeeping items. On this webinar, everyone is muted and the webinar is being recorded. A summary of the webinar, as well as a link to the recording, will be sent out to all registered participants and posted on the US Drought Portal, also known as drought.gov. For questions, please use the question box, which is located within the GoToWebinar control panel. You are welcome to enter questions at any time throughout the webinar. All questions will be answered at the end. Next slide. A brief background about NIDIS, the National Integrated Drought Information System. NIDIS was created by Congress in 2006 with a mandate to help the nation prepare for, mitigate, and respond to the effects of drought. NIDIS does this through a series of activities, including the development of regional drought early warning systems, shown on the map here, and through support to improve drought predictions and forecasting, effective drought planning and preparedness, and assessing the impacts of drought. All of NIDIS's work is done in collaboration with a wide range of partners at all levels. In addition, NIDIS hosts the U.S. Drought Portal at drought.gov, which contains a wealth of information on drought research and conditions. Next slide. We will begin our webinar today with a presentation from the team in Iowa. We will hear from Tim Hall, who is the Hydrology Resources Coordinator with the Iowa Department of Natural Resources. We will also hear from Justin Gleason, the Iowa State Climatologist with the Iowa Department of Agriculture and Land Stewardship. And finally, Sarah Eggert, who is the Recovery Planner with the Iowa Department of Homeland Security and Emergency Management. They will provide a summary of the major components of the Iowa Drought Plan, highlight the process the state of Iowa took to develop the plan, and will reflect on lessons learned from developing the plan. After that, we will hear from Cody Knudsen, who is the Planning Coordinator with the National Drought Mitigation Center. As someone that was involved in the development of the Iowa Drought Plan, Cody will offer some reflections and lessons learned on the overall process. Finally, we will have time for questions at the end. So now, without further ado, I will turn it over to you, Tim, to start the presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Molly. Glad everyone could join us today. We'll, we'll, get, this, we'll get the ball rolling and be happy to answer questions at the end of the webinar. So um, we're going to talk about the 2023 Iowa Drought Plan. It is brand new, and it was effective right at the middle of January when the department heads of the three Iowa departments signed on to the plan. So next slide, please. So we have a, a history of recent droughts in Iowa going back in, in recent memory to 1988, 2012, and then the drought that we just uh, came through in 2020 through 2022. Next slide, please. So um, just a quick background as to where this got started. We had no real drought plan to speak of in the state of Iowa. In 2021, in the midst of some extremely dry conditions, there was a meeting in our state emergency operations center. Um, Homeland Security, Department of Agriculture, DNR, local water utilities were all meeting to talk about some precipitous events in uh, terms of local water supply in central Iowa. And at the end of that meeting, um, we, the representatives from Homeland Security and DNR and IDOLS got together and essentially said, you know, maybe we should have a drought plan. Um, there was no real um, organized effort before then, but that's kind of how it got started. Next slide. So we started the question, we started the discussion by just having a question among the three agency heads or the three agency representatives. Should we have a drought plan? We've been getting by with these emergency operations center um, spontaneous meetings to deal with drought, but the question was, should we have a drought plan? And the answer among those of us who were at that first conversation was absolutely yes, that we should have a drought plan. Um, it would be a great idea to put one together. So the first meeting of folks to start planning drought plan development was in December of 2021. 
um, to kind of get the ball rolling. And our initial desire was to have the drought plan completed in about a year. So next slide. We thought about the questions that uh, people would want answers to, and I get these questions a lot, is what's the point of a drought plan? So we wanted to be in a position to help local governments and local utilities and state agencies to answer these questions. What do we need to know and when do we need to know it? And what do we need to do and when do we need to do it? The sort of frame the whole discussion is how can we keep things in that context? Next slide. What we had in Iowa to begin with was the 1985 water plan. And if you notice the highly sophisticated graphics on the cover of this plan, uh, gives you a clue as to how old this document was. And it references state agencies that don't even exist anymore. Uh, so it was pretty much outdated. There've been a lot of changes uh, since 1985. We've had population change um, numbers in Iowa. We've had uh, changes in animal agriculture in Iowa that, are, that impact water supply. Lots of industry changes. A lot of things have changed since 1985. And this drought plan, this water plan, which has a small section uh, talking about drought, was just not an appropriate document for the state. So we, we didn't start with the 1985 water plan and revise it. We basically started from scratch. Next slide. We put together a core drought team of uh, representatives from our state Department of Homeland Security Emergency Management, um, from the DNR, from the Department of Agriculture. And then we reached out to National Drought Mitigation Center um, to, to get their assistance. We, we really were, we had an idea of what we wanted to do, but no real um, uh, experience in developing a drought plan. So we reached out to NDMC staff um, and Cody got on board early to help us out. And we have a USDA climate hub in Ames, Iowa, uh, with Dennis Toddy, who was the uh, state climatologist in South Dakota. So he helped us out as well. Uh, so we put this core team together. At any one of our discussion meetings, there could have been as few as five or six people or as many as a dozen um, that were involved in the discussion. So next slide. This team, we met every two weeks, starting in March, pretty much all the way through September. We met every two weeks to review progress, discuss questions, share information. Uh, we looked at general geology and hydrogeology of the state. Uh, we had a presentation and information from rural water systems, including Lewis and Clark, which is a big rural water system in South Dakota that pulls water out of the uh, Missouri River system. We took a look at drought plans from other states. Um, I was able to pull up that great list that's online of every other state's drought plan. Um, I did note at the time that ours was comfortably in last place in terms of um, how recent it was. So we've moved from last to first. But those existing drought plans were great. We were able to pull all kinds of great information from them. NDMC was really helpful in helping us understand which of those drought plans we're likely to have relevant and good information for the state of Iowa so we could focus in on drought plans that made sense for us. Um, so we, we borrowed material or ideas or organization from a bunch of other state drought plans. We also had stakeholder input meetings across the state. Um, Sarah and her folks at Homeland Security organized um, stakeholder input meetings. We had four of them across the state plus a virtual meeting. And we were able to get uh, water utility folks, emergency managers. We had some uh, state elected officials. We had water utilities. We had a whole bunch of people that turned out for those meetings and we just kind of had um, open discussion, guided discussion about what drought planning and drought impacts meant to them. And we were able to use that information to help guide us in terms of what the drought plan should look like and what it should do. Next slide. One of the things we did, and this, this showed up in a lot of other state drought plans, is we established a science and data team. We wanted very much for the Iowa drought plan to be driven by science and data. And um, to that end, 
I was able to get our state geologist, our state climatologist, a couple of water supply geologists, the chief operating officer from the Des Moines Water Works, which is the largest water utility in the state of Iowa, and National Weather Service meteorology and hydrology folks to um, volunteer to work on the science and data team. And we asked them to take a look at the triggers and the regions and the parts of the drought plan that are um, sort of the nuts and bolts uh, science pieces of the drought plan. So rather than having anyone directly with one of the regulatory agencies doing that, we turn to the science and, and data team and let them hash out what they thought made sense. They reviewed a whole bunch of data sources and you all probably know there's a ton of data out there relative to drought planning and drought recognition and drought triggers. And um, we didn't start with a preconceived notion of how we would define drought in the state of Iowa, but uh, rather we turned to these folks and said, what do you think makes sense for us in the state of Iowa? And Justin will talk a little bit about where they landed, but we very much wanted the, the triggers and the, the triggers in the drought regions to be based on science and data so that we had something to fall back on uh, when, when we got into a drought situation. So those folks met um, probably once a month or so through most of the summer, um, had email discussions back and forth, um, face-to-face conversations, really dug into some of the data and information, and I think came up with some triggers and some science points that made sense for the state of Iowa. Um, you know, we looked at other states where the U.S. drought monitor was the primary trigger and um, and decided that we wanted to expand the triggers in Iowa. So Justin will review those uh, here in a minute. So next slide. So what we ended up with after uh, about a year of work was the Iowa drought plan. It's um, a document that includes triggers and vulnerabilities, drought regions, um, mitigation. It's a, it's a fairly comprehensive document. It's available um, online. I know um, it's on the list of state drought plan uh, documents so you can find it and, and locate it. I do want to point out that it is not a, it's not in, it's not signed by the governor. We did not get a legislative approval for it. So it is a document that has standing with our agencies, uh, but as we tell folks, it doesn't grant us any additional regulatory authority. Um, it's more of a, a structured document to help us plan for and react to drought. So we have a drought plan. We finished it in about 13 months. So we were, we were aiming for a year and we got it done in a year. And I will point out that there was no specific allocation of monetary resources for this. All of us who worked on the drought plan did our work as part of our uh, regular duties for our roles in our respective departments. So we didn't have an appropriation. We didn't have a budget. Uh, we just figured out how to make it happen. And most of that, um, a lot of the success, I think, was due to the fact that we had some really good documents to work off of to start with. So next slide. So the drought plan, what's in it? We have state drought regions. We broke the state of Iowa into five regions. Uh, we established drought levels and then triggers for drought levels. Um, we established a number of internal communication actions. A lot of what we want to do is have a clear understanding of who needs to get together and who needs to discuss the issues and what are we going to communicate to local governments and state agencies when we get into the various levels of drought. We have, uh, we sort of put those into a matrix. Um, so depending on the drought severity level, uh, different organizations, groups, and individuals have responsibilities that are laid out in the drought plan. And it kind of gets back to my original comment about we, we were meeting in 2021 at the State Emergency Operations Center. The only reason we were meeting is that somebody, um, I think at Homeland Security thought that conditions were getting pretty dire and we should get together. Well, it, it's nice to have those decisions to meet and communicate collected in a document where everyone, everyone can understand when and why we're going to get together. And that's what this action matrix does. It provides 
um, a documented system for us to begin those discussions during times of drought. There's a section on, a, on um, vulnerabilities that was put together by Homeland Security. We tried to identify regions and industries and sectors that were particularly vulnerable to drought. Uh, there are some mitigation recommendations. Our hope is that we can use this plan to get local utilities and governments to think about mitigation efforts ahead of time. Uh, to be doing some things that can prepare us to better respond to drought. And there's a section in the drought plan on uh, updates and plan revisions, and uh, we've identified some additional data and information needs that we'll talk about here in a minute. Next slide. So just a couple of comments about what worked well and, and didn't work well from my perspective. I think that having um, Having folks essentially volunteer from agencies worked well for us because if we didn't have a, a vested interest in drought planning, there wouldn't have been a need to get together. So it worked well that we had people who were truly interested in um, developing a drought plan that spent the time to do it. I think that worked pretty well. Um, what didn't work well, we struggled, I think, a little bit in getting stakeholder input. Uh, Sarah's going to talk a little bit about that, I think. Um, it's hard to get people interested sometimes in, in drought planning. It's not at the top of everybody's list. Um, it, was, it was a struggle sometimes to get people's feedback on the drought plan. Um, as we've begun implementing parts of the drought plan now, we're starting to see areas where we need to shore up some of our details. Um, as Justin and I are working through the drought triggers, uh, we're starting to discover there are some things we need to solidify. So, you know, we wanted to get it done in a year. I don't want to say that we rushed to get it done because I wanted to get it out there. Um, I've been telling folks that we're going to work with it for this next year and identify areas of weakness and then make some revisions. So, um, there's some changes that are going to be made, and hopefully folks won't perceive that as um, an inappropriately organized plan to begin with, but I think it's really just a chance for us to test drive it ahead of time. So, um, you know, what would we do differently? It's really hard to say. I, I think it all went pretty well. I really can't stress enough the value of having 49 other state drought plans that we could access and read through and pick pieces out of to uh, both inform us as to what we ought to do in the Iowa drought plan and maybe inform us as to things that we don't want to do and didn't make sense for us. So um, those are just my comments on this slide and I'll be happy to take questions at the end. So next slide. So we're going to go to Justin now. All right. Thanks, Tim. Uh, thank you uh, for uh, highlighting the structural aspects of the drought plan. And just personally, it's a 14 or 15th month process, and I don't think it could have gone any better. We had a lot of stakeholder input. We had a lot of feedback from the public, from uh, stakeholders and commodity groups across the state. So we view this as a living document, and it's a it's going to be an iterative process through the next year or two. Uh, honing in those triggers for different levels of drought. You think of drought across uh, just the definition of drought is a lack of precipitation or a lack of moisture. Well, we have different forms of drought. We have meteorological drought, uh, precipitation deficits. Then we get into agricultural drought when we start to see impacts of longer term dryness on crops, uh, specialty crops, row crops. Then we get into hydrological drought, the absence of surplus water. We start to see uh, impacts on drinking water and water availability. Then we get into those socioeconomic and ecological drought that where we really see large scale impacts. Uh, so of course, drought is a slow moving disaster. It's not like flooding or severe weather. Uh, so it's a, a different beast. So in terms of monitoring across the state, one of my most important tasks as state climatologist is coordinating our weekly recommendation to the U.S. Drought Monitor author for the drought depiction that's released on Thursday each week. When we were looking at the state and we were, uh, hold on, 
when we were looking at the state, we, we determined using uh, data from our state geologist, Dr. Keith Schilling, that specific landforms and uh, differences uh, across the state would help us uh, produce drought regions for monitoring. So what we used uh, across the state, uh, similar landforms in which we thought that meteorological and hydrological impacts would uh, be normalized or they would be the same across these drought regions. And as you can see with this map here, we have five drought regions for the state of Iowa, with one being northwestern Iowa and five being southeastern Iowa. Uh, drought region two is an interesting drought region in that it includes the Des Moines lobe, so glacial till uh, from millions of years ago that really uh, the geomorphology and the hydrologics within each of these drought regions uh, should dictate how our trigger levels work and hence our monitoring efforts across the state. Next slide, please. So when we look at the US drought monitor uh, map each month or each week, we see these uh, levels, D0, abnormally dry, not drought, but representative of more short-term 30 to 60 day dryness, kind of a sentinel or a, a canary in the coal mine to tell us that we're trending uh, on the drier side. And if drier and hotter conditions persist, we could shift into um, uh, more drought conditions. So we go to, to D1, which is the moderate drought category, all the way to D4, exceptional drought, which we see right around Sioux City right now. In terms of percentiles, you look at 100 years of data, D4 conditions you wouldn't see once, but every 50 to 100 years. So this gives you an idea on the severity of drought conditions. Now, with the Iowa drought plan, we wanted to um, differentiate ourselves from the US drought monitor depiction in terms of the levels of drought and also the categorization of drought conditions across the state. But we also wanted to include the US drought monitor given that state and federal programs are dictated by a specific levels of drought and also how long a county has been in a specific classification of drought. Next slide, please. So when we look at the Iowa drought plan, of course, with any plan, we, we want to centralize information, but also avoid confusion and not get complicated. And it's easy to get complicated uh, in a 55 page plan, but what we generally looked at were levels in which we could uh, categorize drought, but also the severity of the drought or lack thereof. So we came up with four categories, normal, watch, warning, and emergency. And we think about these uh, from a, a large scale, a state scale, all the way down into county or basin level when we start to get into those D3 and D4 conditions. So on our normal level, it's routine monitoring of water supply and our meteorological indicators, precipitation deficits, standardized precipitation index, stream flows, soil moisture. When we see this normal category, all conditions are generally stable, so not trending either way and near normal. Then we get into the watch category. These are where we start to see a increase in dryness across the drought regions. And conditions are characterized by short-term dryness, so we think 30 to 60 out 90 days. And we also start to see impacts of meteorological drought on agric agriculture, so slowing crop, crop uh, and pasture growth, you start to see uh, pastures burn up. This is giving us an idea of we're moving in a direction as we started in uh, May and June of 2020 with this three year long drought. Then we get into a uh, warning where conditions are starting to see uh, Im impacts on water shortages. So um, uh, producers are starting to have to truck in water for their cattle or livestock. And then we start to see larger scale impacts. Now we see larger scale impacts that can impact impact a smaller scale. So in terms of monitoring, this is when we start to drill down on smaller scale, um, either basin level, county level, or even um, municipalities in which we pull in more data. The science and data team starts to meet more often. The uh, drought uh, core group starts to meet more often as dictated in the uh, matrix. And then finally, we get into the emergency level where we're starting to see widespread and more catastrophic 
impacts from uh, longer term drought conditions. So we start to see shortages in reservoirs, streams, wells, especially in northwestern Iowa with the shallow alluvials. And then we see widespread uh, crop and pasture losses as we did back in 2012 during the, the last larger scale pervasive drought. So in these, in these um, instances, this is when the governor or the secretary of agriculture, the United States Secretary of Agriculture, could issue emergency declarations for localized areas or counties. But again, this is a, a, a pretty simple matrix in terms of normal to emergency and those trigger levels which dictate those um, uh, levels. Uh, next slide, please. So we use a variety and a myriad of uh, drought indicators to determine these drought levels. And again, this is a living document. The trigger table, I believe, use, we use four triggers in, those, in the trigger table. Uh, we can uh, always add. Soil moisture is going to be a very big and important tool that we uh, can use across the state that we need to build out. But right now we use precipitation deficits. So the percent of normal precipitation on a three to six month uh, scale. And varieties of, of levels of those precipitation deficits will dictate whether we're in a normal watch warning or emergency. Then we also used the standard precipitation index and SPI is an index based on accumulated precipitation for various time scales, 30 days out to three months or out to 36 months. So various time scales will dictate shorter term deterioration versus longer term droughts and precipitation deficits. And SPI ranges from plus two, which would be uh, basically W4 uh, on the wetness scale, all the way to negative two, which would be uh, D3, D4. SPI is the most common indicator worldwide for detecting meteorological drought. And once we detect meteorological drought, then we start to use other indicators uh, to look at agricultural impacts, but also hydrological impacts. Uh, SPI measures precipitation be uh, deficits based on observed precipitation over the period of interest versus the climatologically expected precipitation. So it gives us an historical perspective on the SPI, what precipitation behavior we're seeing and how that relates to other uh, historical events. We also use a, a stream flow index called the standardized stream flow index, which was developed by Dr. Keith Schilling and his group at the Iowa, Iowa Geological Survey. And SSI is a metric that compares current stream flows against the historic record to determine how far away current stream flows are from uh, historic uh, river levels and uh, metrics based on observed data going back uh, to 1960. Then we also use the U.S. Drought Monitor, uh, the traditional categories D0 to D4, to give us an indication of how long a region has been in uh, specific drought category, uh, categories, but also are we trending one way or the other? Now, the U.S. Drought Monitor is an important depiction because, as I mentioned earlier, state and federal programs rely on uh, the, long, the longevity of a drought category for a county, uh, but also the severity of that drought category. So it was important to roll the Drought Monitor depiction in with the drought plan to marry these two together. Next slide, please. So on the left-hand side here are as a percent of normal precipitation for the state. These are updated as of yesterday with the drought map overlaid on top of it. The top uh, depiction on either side is the 30-day um, uh, percent of normal precipitation. On the left, top right is the standardized precipitation index for 30 days. On the bottom there is the six-month a six to nine month speed uh, on the bottom right, and then the percent of normal precipitation on the bottom left. Why I show these, we've had a very wet uh, three to six months across the state of Iowa. Winter time, December, January, February was the fourth wettest in 151 years of records. Uh, February was the 11th wettest February for the state. So you look at the indicators on the top, were on the wet side, W3, W4 on SPI, and then the percent of normal precipitation above 100, 200, even 300% in the short term. Now, drought is a balancing act between shorter term improvements 
versus our longer term precipitation deficits that you can see on the bottom two plots there. We've had SPI values up in that D3 and D4 region that reflect D3 and D4 uh, going back nine months, 10 months, 12 months, going back 36 months. Uh, but given the weather conditions that we've seen recently, we start to see a convergence of evidence towards improvement across the state. And that's where we've seen uh, good improvement across the state over the last three weeks in the drought depiction. So these two meteorologically based fields are two of the indicators that we use to determine uh, what our trigger levels will be on a monthly basis. Next slide, please. Uh, so here are trigger levels, and I mentioned we have four indices right now. Uh, on the vertical axis there, you can see the categorization of drought conditions. So normal watch, which we would uh, we would basically look at a regional approach across the state. And then we get down to warning. We pay specific attention to smaller scale locations across the state, watersheds, uh, rural water municipalities, uh, and then we get into the emergency level. And we think of emergency level now in that drought region one, we're in a watch there in, uh, given our indices, but Sioux City is currently with D4, so we would include that as a, a more specific municipality in terms of emergency uh, watch levels. Again, the four indices, the SSI, the U.S. drought designation, percent of normal precipitation, and then the standardized precipitation index. So we've built out these triggers specifically for um, each of the categorizations. Now, for those on, on the uh, webinar that are familiar with the drought monitoring process, we like to see a convergence of evidence. We have uh, multiple uh, moisture variables, uh, surface moisture variables, that we would like to see move towards one direction. Are we moving towards uh, D1, D2? Are we moving out of D1, D2? So an important aspect of these trigger tables, number one, we have indices in which show us that we are in a specific category, but we're also looking at the trend. Are we moving uh, into more uh, into wetter times that would mitigate drought implications? It would necessitate improvement are we moving the opposite direction in which we need to pay more attention uh, to specific basins within each of the drought regions and convene our core team and the science and data team more often as uh, defined in the trigger tables or in the matrices. So overall, you can see here, we'll look at the precipitation. If we're greater than 75% of normal three to six months, we would consider that normal. And then we get into the emergency level there, 25 to 50% of normal for three months. We don't really spend a lot of time considering flash drought or rapid onset drought, but we have built out the trigger tables to sense the, uh, the possibility of flash drought. And talking with Tim and talking with Molly this week, <clears throat> uh, we, we do need to include more information on flash drought and think about those in our trigger tables. Soil moisture will be a big uh, tool that we can use to monitor flash drought considerations. But overall, all four of these indices, if we see three of those indices uh, in a specific category, that's when we would uh, trigger those categorizations for um, a given drought region. Next slide, please. Okay, so again, we're using existing data sources for those four indices. Now, in my role as state climatologist, I use more uh, indices to look at drought monitoring, uh, given our, um, our our shared interest across the state, but also submitting our recommendations each week uh, to the U.S. Drought Monitor. So we use these four drought indicators to calculate and compare uh, to the trigger levels. Now, of course, the trigger levels are not always going to point in the, the same direction as a drought category. And that's why, again, this is an iterative process with the science and data team of building out a more robust guidance in terms of the trigger levels. But structurally, these four trigger levels do show us the inputs meteorologically and the outputs hydrologically and in the stream flow. Soil moisture, again, is one of those uh, fields that we really need uh, more data on, and it, it is in our hopes that perhaps this drought plan will be a stepping stone uh, as a legislative ask to have uh, more money for um, 
soil moisture monitoring across the state. We have a an infrastructure with the Iowa Flood Center, but also the Iowa uh, Environmental Mesonet to uh, update our stations and include more soil moisture monitoring, but we really need uh, uh, monies to do that. So in cases of severe conditions a drought emergency as we would we would have around sioux city a drought region will be subdivided to identify the watersheds within those drought regions but also even smaller scale uh, county level observations that we can pull from cocoa Ras rain gauges are also our national weather service co-op stations uh, next slide please uh, i don't know when sarah starts uh, but these are our internal and external communication uh, matrices. And as uh, as the drought coordinator, the state climatologist will be the drought coordinator moving forward uh, in the categories from normal watch warning emergency necessitate different levels of uh, input, but also different um, uh, uh, meeting times in which we would we would pull together our core group. So I'll let Sarah take over as she knows this much better than I do. Thanks, Justin. Thank you, Tim. And Molly, thanks so much for this opportunity to join. Um, thanks to all the attendees for being here with us. I think for the sake of time, because I personally would love to hear from Cody, that external perspective, if we can go ahead and skip a few slides forward to plan revision and updates, um, we can share a little bit more about that. So Tim asked at the very beginning, um, or he mentioned at the very beginning that the three of departments asked, you know, should we have a drought plan? And we got to the answer of yes. I will let you know that internally here at HSCMD, that was not uh, an easy answer to come to. We had to have some internal discussion about should we have a drought plan? Because typically we don't do hazard specific planning. Um, we generally do a multi-hazard approach and we are already required by code to have some plans, especially our Iowa emergency response plan, um, and then we submit to the federal government our state hazard mitigation plan as well. So we did get to the answer of yes, I think, um, eventually, and we're happy we did. It was really great to collaborate with the DNR and IDOLS um, to develop this. So um, if you can keep going ahead, another slide there. Um, keep going. We're going to skip all these. We can answer questions later. Yep, keep moving forward. Two more, I think. One back, there we go, thank you. All right, that's fine, I can talk about this. So we have the flexibility to update the plan as we don't have the intention to submit this plan to be adopted, adopted um, by the legislature at the moment. So I think that flexibility is in our favor, but at the same time, we wanted to set a timeline um, of revision and review so that this just didn't collect dust on the shelf. And so over the next um, couple of years, we will be reviewing the plan. Um, as of now, we have set a two-year mark to do the first update. And then from there, every five years, we will look at updating the plan. Um, and that corresponds with um, every five years, we submit a state hazard mitigation plan. And so a lot of the work that we did for this drought plan, we're also using in our state hazard mitigation plan. So um, no legislative ado adoption, but our directors did endorse, um, as well as the Secretary of Agriculture did endorse this plan. And we conducted a tabletop exercise right away after the release of the plan um, and gathered a lot of information. So it was easy to get in our own little silo of our drought planning team and you know all of our work seemed like it was good and applicable, but we invited other partners from our departments, um, other colleagues to join in this exercise to say, does this make sense? You know, um, does each level um, correspond with other plans that we have? And we've already done that on February 15th and realized, well, actually we, we have a lot of updates to make. And so we'll ma be making those over the next two years. You can go to the next slide. Um, so if Tim wanted to mention this uh, or expand on this, we just submitted or just released the water summary update. It has been since uh, 2012. It's um, something that DNR does, but we're um, moving toward the Iowa drought plan format. And so that's available on the DNR website if you wanna check that out. 
Um, and so I think with that, we can hand it over to Cody and we'll have time for questions at the end. Great, thank you so much for that wonderful presentation. Um, so yes, we will go ahead and turn it over to Cody right now for his uh, presentation. Thanks, Cody. Yeah, thank you, Molly. Uh, yeah, uh, thanks for having me today, and it's good to see so many people on the on the line today. Uh, my name is Cody Knudsen, and I head up our drought planning program at the National Drought Mitigation Center. Uh, we're located in the School of Natural Resources at the University of Nebraska Lincoln, and it was you know a pleasure to be part of this work. Um, you know, we really had the opportunity, uh, probably a little more than usual, to sit down and go through the process with the state agencies. So I know uh, we probably learned uh, just as much as we we're able to provide. Um, could you go to the next slide, please? But Molly just asked if I could uh, provide a few reflections on this process. And I wanted to start out by saying um, the Iowa drought planning process was part of a trend in states developing drought mitigation and response plans. And as you'll see back starting, say, in 1982, there were only about three states that had drought plans, and they are all focused on drought response, what to do during the drought emergency. Um, and as you can see, there's been a trend over time of one for more drought plans. You can see uh, from the 1988, 1989, 90 drought, that spurred a lot of states uh, to, to um, create more response plans. But then with the creation of agencies like the National Drought Mitigation Center, like NOAA's National Integrated Drought Information System Program, there's been more effort on developing not only drought response plans, but drought mitigation and response plans. Plans that outline um, actions that can be done in advance of drought to reduce the likelihood of experiencing drought impacts, and also um, identifies who should do what during a drought uh, planning process. And as Tim mentioned, as you follow the, uh, the diagram up to the right, um, Iowa is the, I should mention on, on that map, the states in blue are the states that have drought response plans. The states in green are the states that have drought mitigation and response plan. The darker the color, the newer the plan. And Iowa is showing up uh, bright green there, as uh, Tim mentioned, uh, probably the newest uh, state for having a drought mitigation response plan. And you'll also notice that almost every state has some type of drought plan now. There's about 46 states that have them, 17 that include mitigation and response. So part of a growing trend. Um, can you go to the next uh, slide? Okay, so in terms of this particular project, what are a few thoughts um, thinking back over the process? And one, you know, Tim already mentioned this too, and and so did Justin. You know, I thought it was a nice leveraging of resources. Um, they already mentioned bringing in the Iowa State agencies and re reaching out to the stakeholders, but also bringing in Dennis Toddy from the USDA Midwest Climate Hub and, and ourselves at the National Drought Mitigation Center, myself, Kelly Smith, uh, Mark Svoboda, were able to put a little extra time into this. We had a, a USDA um, cooperative agreement that allowed for us to do a project with the state of Iowa. And the um, partners at Iowa, what they really wanted to do is use those resources to focus on their state planning effort. So we had a little bit of extra funding uh, for staff time to participate in the, in the project. But also we are able to bring in some new um, uh, planning materials. We had a project that's been developed over the last few years with NIDIS to develop some new drought planning materials. And right now we've got a draft of that that we were able to share uh, with the planning team. And also we had done a project where we looked at um, drought mitigation actions in the Midwest, where we looked at a project again supported by NIDIS, where we looked, we pulled out drought mitigation actions from state drought plans, state water plans, state climate plans, um, and the hazard mitigation plans. And we put those into a database that the planners were able to look at to see some examples of what other state plans are including for drought mitigation actions. And so all that material was available um, along with the state drought plans uh, that are in our database as well. 
So it was really nice. I'd see that as a win-win for both. One, um, that the planners were able to see some of the latest drought planning materials out there, but also right now we're working to see, you know, what they thought of those materials. Um, how could we improve, improve upon them? So we're gaining some um, input and feedback back on those materials that we provided uh, as well. Okay, um, and we'll be developing um, a case study um, and be providing some of those materials, trying to get those out to people uh, in the near future as well with, uh, with NIDIS. Okay, uh, next slide, please. Okay, a few more things. Um, as was mentioned, this was a relatively quick process for developing a drought plan. You know, about a year from some of the initial conversations. And then I would say really some of the meat of the work, the writing um, and the stakeholder engagement, that was probably over a six or seven month period. And on both ends, there was some initial conversations about what to include and on the end, some review. But a lot of that meat was done in about a six, seven month uh, period. And relatively inexpensive. You know, some of these plans can cost hundreds of thousands of dollars. Uh, each time you update them. And this one was, you know, a, a labor of love from different agencies, uh, mainly staff time, not that that's free time, uh, but it didn't require an additional outlay uh, of funds. And so I see that as, as a positive for this. It doesn't have to cost a, a lot of money to develop a drought plan or update one. And it includes the three pillars uh, of drought planning that we call them. It has a monitoring and early warning system, it had a vulnerability and impact assessment, sometimes uh, called a risk assessment, and also mitigation and response actions. And, you know, as brought up, because it was somewhat of a quick process, um, it was, you know, there was a lot of discussion that went into it. But there's always more studies that can be done. There's always more input you can gather from stakeholders. And so um, there's always more work that can be done on those. But I think this provides a really strong foundation for the state of Iowa to build off of uh, moving into the future. Okay, next slide. And I, I wanted to bring this up. Uh, Sarah mentioned this, but you know I think the uh, the state gets bonus points for because they already exercised the plan. When we talk about drought planning, we say we really don't want a plan to sit on the shelf. You really have to take it out and test it once in a while. And they already did it. Um, and it's what it's something that we say should always be done, and it's probably um, not done as much as it should be. Uh, but as they went through the plan, so they had the plan, they brought in the, the agencies that had something to do with implementation of the plan, sat down, went through some scenarios, and as was mentioned, they found some areas that they could already improve upon, and they have a schedule for some of those updates. Um, and then, of course, the real test is, you know, how that plan will work uh, during the next drought, um, ongoing and the next drought. and um, and so, so we do like to call it a living document, that it can be updated as you find new information, as you go through a drought event, as you learn more uh, about the state and the effects of drought and how you can better manage it, that uh, it'll be updated through uh, you know, their, schedule, their schedule for updates. And I just wanted to point out, on the right-hand side of the screen, you'll see a, a drought scenario-based guide. Again, this was an NDMC and NIDIS project where we're looking at what people have done to test plans and go through drought scenarios. There's a lot of examples on there that uh, if you're interested in doing the same, there is some guidance out there for you to, uh, to look at. Okay, um, and I think that is it. Um, I just wanted to again say thank you for allowing us to be part of the process. And again, um, you know, it's, it's a strong foundation to build from. You don't want to be paralyzed um, by assessment you have to put something on paper, and I think this was a really good foundation. Great, thank you so much, Cody. Um, so now we do have time for some questions uh, for our presenters. Um, so remind, just a reminder to use the questions box in GoToWebinar um, and go ahead and type your question in there. And if there's a specific speaker you want to address your question to, just include their name. And thank you speakers for joining me back on camera. Um, I'm gonna start us out really quick with a, a question. Um, so you just mentioned, Cody, how the state has already 
exercise the plan through some sort of tabletop exercise. And I was wondering, um, Sarah or Tim or whoever would like to speak to that, can you just talk a little bit more about what that um, process was to sort of test the plan, which I think was relatively recently, correct? Sarah, why don't you handle that? Yes, that's correct. So I partnered with our exercise officer here at uh, HSEMD who had nothing to do with the drought planning process. And I think that was helpful to engage somebody that was not, you know, in the trenches and designing the plan. And we didn't really use a scenario, but we wanted to walk through the table um, that talks about the various levels that we um, have designed and just to validate that, see if it's accurate. And so we brought in a lot of people that are involved in the State Emergency Operations Center to see what they thought and, you know, are you doing this? Um, what else would you be doing? Is this outside of your normal duties? Would it be drought specific? And so we went level to level and had that conversation. Um, Cody and a few others were there as well offering input. So it was about a two hour process, um, but in the two hours, we really did identify a few areas that, um, weren't wrong, but needed improvement. And I, th I think that's going to be really helpful as we look to make that update in a year and a half. Great, thank you. Uh, we do have a couple of questions here. Um, one says that legislative approval has been mentioned several times and they're curious, will the plan eventually need to be approved by the legislature? Well, I'll, I'll start on that. <clears throat> we. We looked at other state plans and are aware of other states where drought plans are approved by their legislatures. And we decided not to go down that route route for a couple of reasons. Uh, one of the most important one in my mind is if you get regulatory approval for your drought plan, then you kind of need to get regulatory approval to change anything in the drought plan. And we at least anticipate making some revisions in the first few years. Um, it's it's not a power grab drought plan, so I don't know that having legislative approval is something that we would ever really be interested in. There may be elements of implementation by various state agencies that would require some legislative action, but we we try to stay away from that because it's it's like most states, it's cumbersome, it takes a lot of time, and this is intended to be a streamlined process. So I would say unless Unless we are forced to, I can't see this going down the legislative approval route. Okay, thank you. Um, the next question is, why did you choose drought boundaries by county instead of by watershed? Well, we started with the landform regions, which are pretty freeform regions, but Justin, you might address this from the perspective of availability of climate data on county boundaries. Yes, absolutely. So we we talk about climatologies. We have the nine uh, uh, climate divisions across the state and each state has climate divisions. So that was our, uh, I think, jumping off point for uh, where we were going to monitor the drought regions. So we, with the Iowa Geological Survey and D Dr. Keith Schilling uh, looking at the various landform regions across the state, you know, people think Iowa is, is basically flat, but we have different soil types, we have different um, top topographical features across the state. And looking at those features and the hydrologics and meteorological uh, implications, we based those landform regions on where we thought meteorology and hydrology were going to be um, basically standard across each of the regions. So the availability of weather and climate information at the county level dictated that we draw those boundaries as close uh, it, within those landform regions that we could. So it's, it's an, a necessity uh, when we're looking at weather and climate data um, uh, from majority of that, yes. There's, uh, also a, a pra there's also a pragmatic side to the question. Um, you could theoretically, we could have just taken the state of Iowa and said, we have one drought region in the state. Or we could have taken 99 counties and said, we're going to treat each county as their own separate drought region. But that would have been extremely difficult in terms of managing all of the data that comes from that. So really what we're trying to do is find an appropriate middle ground between one and 99. Um, so that's kind of how the discussion started. Um, 
And, and as Justin pointed out, it's landform regions that make some sense from a science perspective squared off with county boundaries. And just we can to add always, to, oh, go ahead, okay. Justin. Um, thanks, Sarah. So, and just to drill down on that, we have uh, county boundaries there, but when we start to get into more uh, the watch warning and emergency, that's when we can drill down into those basins, into the counties or into the municipalities uh, to get better information. So that, I think that's built into the trigger matrix as well. Yeah, just to quickly add, from the emergency management perspective, we wanted to leave open the possibility of having a proclamation of disaster, and that would be at the county level as well. And so there's a lot we need to look into about what that would be, but I think having it at the county level is helpful from that regard. All right, thank you. Um, one more question here from the audience. Um, did you involve user groups like farmers to identify needs? I'll, I'll take the, the agricultural side of that, but yes, we had those four in-person stakeholder meetings where you had a variety of attendees from local water, commodities groups, Iowa soybean, Iowa corn. Uh, so, so we had input across the board. The virtual meeting was also um, well attended. Uh, so definitely the input that we received from the agricultural sector was uh, included in the plan, but also the plan was then released back to those stakeholders for additional input. So I'll let Tim or, or Sarah um, include more, but uh, definitely input was uh, much needed and much appreciated. Yeah, and I think Justin, that, that's exactly right. The other thing I'll add is that as we are promoting the release and now the use of the Iowa drought plan, we're getting a lot of questions and requests from individuals to come talk to them. So every time that Justin or myself or Sarah or someone from Sarah's organization goes out and talks to folks, it gives us another chance to reinforce the fact that the drought plan is here, but we also recognize that we need to be making changes in the first year or two. So it's a great chance for us to, um, to collect comments. We actually have a, a Google Doc that we share between the three of us where we put questions that we're getting from audiences so that when we circle back in six months or nine months to actually do a hard rewrite, we can go back to that list and say, okay, did we address this question? Did we address this question? Did we address this question? So um, it's sort of a, an opportunity for us to go back and, and revisit stakeholder input. Great. I just have one quick question here, just another minute or so left. Um, so one of you mentioned that this plan, and I know, Tim, you and I talked about this, you matched it up with the update for the, I believe, hazard mitigation plan, and that that was really beneficial to have those time together. So I was wondering if one of you is able to expand on that. So it's my office that is ultimately responsible for hosting that plan. And so we are due for an update. It's every five years that that state hazard mitigation plan is submitted to the federal government. And so we have a mitigation bureau and several of their staff that are involved in that process, which is quite lengthy. Um, we're a key component of our drought planning team as well. And so they are doing a lot of the risk assessments, identifying the vulnerabilities um, and a lot of the content that was developed for this drought plan will be included in our hazard mitigation plan. So really the challenge that we had was how does this drought plan fit into existing plans that are you know, in Iowa code or required at the federal level because this was a voluntary effort. Okay, great. Well, with that, I will go ahead and wrap it up. Again, a big thank you to all of our speakers. Um, we will provide a summary of this recording along with a link to the webinar recording via email, and it will also be posted on drought.gov, hopefully later today or tomorrow. Um, following the webinar, please take a few minutes to provide feedback on the information you heard today with a brief survey that will, will pop up for you. Um, so thank you again, and that concludes the webinar.